Welcome back to Core TV Live and opening statements in our spotlight this morning. Child killer Susan Smith, who is hoping her ex-husband won't block her upcoming parole. We got a very special guest doing everything he can to keep Susan behind bars. Now, Susan Smith was sentenced to 30 years to life in prison for the murders of her sons, Michael Alexander, back in 1994. Now, she told police that a black male had forced her out of her car and drove away with her two sons still inside. Now, the car was found in a lake and the boys inside of course, it turned out that there was no mystery man and that Susan Smith was the only person responsible for this. They're her beautiful boys uh, there now. Now, Smith reportedly told relatives that she has spent enough time in prison and she feels like she should be released. What do you think about that? I want to welcome on the show very special guest uh, this morning. He was the solicitor for South Carolina's 16th Judicial District. You know him and love him for being one of our guest legal analysts, attorney Tommy Pope. Uh, good to see you, friend. Um, this case, it comes up a lot, as you know. Uh, you tried one of the most famous cases in the world of, of true crime. And, and now here we are. This woman is up for parole. And, and she wants her husband's support. Uh, Tommy, what can you tell us about this? What is her husband David's position, if you know? You know, David, during the nine days she was claiming there was a carjacker, David stood by her side, even though she was telling him the boyfriend she was trying to get would probably want to come visit. And he was supportive of her up till the end. You know, there was a dual investigation with law enforcement. You, As you know, you always look at the, at the family members in addition to looking for the carjacker. Um, and so David's always been supportive, but when the truth came out, uh, he was my rock when it came to seeking the death penalty because ultimately, you know, it's difficult to seek the death penalty against a female. Um, it's difficult in a small town. And ultimately, I sought the death penalty and she received life. But David's always been solid. He has not been vindictive. It's all about justice for Michael and Alex. And, and I respect that. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I know you do, Tommy. Uh, Tommy, what are the odds that she goes free? What do you think? You know, you, Julie, you've been in front of a lot of juries and you never know what you think they're coming out with. And to and, and, and a certain extent, I think the probate, uh, parole board is similar um, in that, you know, they will take both sides. They will hear, you know, her behavior in prison has mostly been self-centered. She's had sex with guards, you know, all the things she's done. The flip side is she hadn't killed another inmate in prison or things of that nature. But I also think they'll look at the crime. For me, the most important is, the sentence she received of life in 1995, the judge, the jury could not be told that life didn't mean life. In other words, they were told, take life in your plain and usual meaning. So even afterwards, the jurors were saying, she'll have to sit in prison, she'll be remorseful about Michael and Alex, and she'll be there the rest of her life. Well, the two fallacies are, she's clearly worried about Susan and her, and her sexual relationships or other relationships, not about Michael and Alex. And again, the jury didn't know she should be eligible. So it's not from a vindictive standpoint, I don't think with David, it certainly isn't with me, uh, it's from a justice standpoint. Oh, absolutely, Tommy. Well said. Uh, those beautiful children, Michael, as I understand it, was three years old at the time, and Alex only 14 months old when she killed them both. Uh, the pain that certainly her husband David has felt, I'm sure, hasn't gotten any easier. And then now it, it, it's time, and she's, she's trying to get him to support her. Um, Tommy, based on what you saw and the interactions, does that surprise you that all these years later she would be so bold as to try to get his help here? No, I, I, that, that doesn't surprise me. Again, um, you know, certainly there have got to be mental health issues. You and I talk about this all the time. Anybody that takes a life, there's something going on. But, you know, we used to say that Susan, you know, one definition in DSM would be histrionic. You know, she's either the victim or the princess. And, you know, this whole thing to me was contrived. If she gives up the kids, she's a bad mother. But if the carjacker takes the kids, she's a victim and more worthy of Tom Finley, the, the paramoy, Paramore, the boyfriend, come in to rescue her. So, I mean, she put some thought into it of what ends were best for Susan. And I think that's consistently where she's lived her life and, you know, what the reason she reaches out to David. 
And look at this handsome attorney. Look at him right here. You recognize that guy? <laughs> Our control room is hey. loving seeing this video of you, Tommy. They're all watching it right now and said, draw Tommy's attention to who we have on the screen here. Uh, America fell in love with you. You did such a brilliant job on this case. This was not an easy one to try, Tommy. That had to have been really upsetting advocating for those kids, wasn't it? Uh, it was, you know, of course, I've tried a lot of cases, but I was also just a few years into office, as, as you saw the child that uh, was in the courtroom. I was 32 at the time. I had gotten elected when I was 30. And um, I always joke, said I was kind of the doozy, doogie hauser of prosecutors. And suddenly I'm <laughs> dealing with, the, you know, with the, the biggest case that we'd certainly ever seen here. And it was the same time OJ was going on. And, and then you couple that with, again, I've seen a lot of horrible things in my law enforcement career. I think the combination of the media, the combination of Susan dragging it out for the nine days, you know, where everybody hoped and, and felt that perhaps we'll find this car, we'll find this carjacker, even though you know from a law enforcement standpoint, carjackers don't take children normally. But right. but anyway, there was the hope, and then um, it was dashed when we found out she did it selfishly. Uh, she sure did, and we see more selfishness, selfishness now uh, as she's uh, trying to uh, get out of prison. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens when it's time for her parole hearing. I know we'll have many more questions for you. Uh, Tommy Pope, uh, you're the best. Thank you so much for all of the case insights, and we'll look forward to seeing you again on Opening Statements soon.